Hello, I am Stacy Best. I'm an assistant bar counsel at the Office of Bar Counsel. Today I will be talking about legal marketing, ethical tips in the digital age. Um, before we begin, I just have a few things that I want to um, bring to your attention. One is that um, while I am uh, an assistant bar counsel at the Office of Bar Counsel, um, the views and the thoughts that I will express uh, are in no way um, sanctioned or authorized by the Office of Bar Counsel in terms of how how we would approach a particular matter, uh, and certainly in no way do I speak for the Board of Bar Overseers or the Supreme Judicial Court um, that are the um, fact finders and deciding bodies for any disciplinary matter. Uh, also before I begin, uh, I would like to say some, uh, a few general thoughts about um, how we can approach marketing in the digital age. I think it's always helpful to think about how we would approach a matter uh, when you're using a computer. It's good to appreciate how it would be done um, in the analog. So for those of us who grew up in the age of uh, technology, we might remember how it was done with uh, pencil and paper, and that's a good good um, barometer for whether or not something is appropriate. If it wasn't appropriate using a pencil and a piece of paper, it's not going to be any more appropriate um, uh, because you're behind a computer. For those who grew up uh, after uh, uh, digital age uh, had begun and weren't so used to using pencil and paper, ask someone a little older and they might tell you how it was done old school style. The other thing I think is helpful to uh, take note of is that just because you know someone else who is doing a creative marketing strategy or using a creative marketing strategy doesn't mean that uh, it is an ethical marketing strategy. So uh, don't be in lemming and uh, make sure that you uh, uh, consult the ethical rules before you decide how you're going to approach a matter. So I'd like to start with talking about advertisement. We're going to talk about advertisement, uh, solicitation, and the various um, activities and marketing strategies that uh, I have heard uh, a bit about and that I'm aware of, and helpful, hopefully give you some ethical uh, tips uh, to keep you uh, safe and out of uh, harm's way. First thing I want to say is that advertisement uh, is an indirect um, form of communication. It is a statement about the lawyer's services, and it's designed to make the public aware that the services are, of the lawyer are available. The rule um, relevant to advertisement is Mass uh, Rule of Professional Conduct 7.2. This uh, rule allows uh, lawyers to pay someone to, uh, or pay for advertisement, to place an advertisement, and to pay someone to attend to the task of associated with creating and posting the advertisement. That means that you can um, pay someone to write and place the ads, but lawyers should be aware that you may not shift your ethical obligation to anyone that you employ to write or place an ad. So what that means is you have a responsibility to be uh, to ensure um, that the ads that you are pla that you place comply with the ethical rules. And uh, that is um, pursuant to Mass Rule of Professional Conduct 5.3 uh, in the employment of non-lawyers. Obviously, every other, if you're employing a lawyer to assist you with this, then that lawyer also has ethical obligations. But as well, um, because you're employing someone, you have a, a responsibility to uh, supervise that individual. We've seen situations where um, uh, lawyers have posted on websites or, or have allowed others to uh, handle their advertising and they might claim that they were unaware that the advertise, advertisement was misleading or had other ethical concerns and um, unfortunately that is not a sufficient answer to the problem. So a lawyer is required to take steps reasonably necessary to ensure that a non-lawyer's employee's conduct is consistent with the lawyer's obligation. And also Rule 8.4a prohibits lawyers from violating uh, the rules of professional conduct through someone else. So now let's talk a little bit about um, the different uh, advertising strategies that people have used. 
a lot of lawyers are trying to figure out how to uh, have an effective media presence. Um, time is money, so a lot of lawyers are also concerned about how to differentiate themselves um, from the pack without taking on a whole new job, spending a lot of time writing um, and um, uh, being involved in their uh, web presence. Some lawyers are using websites, blogs, their Facebook page, and Twitter to reach an audience. Um, and each of these is permissible, but each of them has uh, a risk also associated with it or potential pitfalls. Uh, first, let's tackle websites and Facebook pages. Uh, remember, the lawyer is responsible for the content of a website and or his or her Facebook page. Um, that means that um, the lawyer needs to be uh, assured that uh, the content on the page uh, is consistent with his ethical obligations. You see that I have on the bottom uh, left-hand side of the slide uh, um, put the relevant rules of professional conduct that you should consult when designing your page uh, and or your Facebook, uh, your website or your Facebook page. I like to um, uh, liken uh, a website uh, and or a Facebook page to letterhead or a yellow page ads. Those of us who are of a certain age might remember um, when we use things like uh, yellow page ads, I, I think now they're mostly electronic. Uh, the first rule of thumb to think about is that uh, the web page cannot and the letterhead cannot be deceptive. So if you're using letterhead, for instance, and you're citing, um, listing all of your lawyers, uh, and it's a Massachusetts, um, your, your office is located in Massachusetts, but you have lawyers who are not licensed uh, in Massachusetts, you should be sure to indicate that there may be a limitation on that particular lawyer's right to practice. Uh, in Massachusetts. Hopefully, um, we can sort of skip over the issue of your firm name, but we have seen situations where uh, a solo practitioner um, seeking to assure the public that they have resources to handle the matter have used uh, names that are deceptive, such as um, uh, Stacy Best and Associates, when in fact, I'm alone in my office uh, and I have no associates. So that would be improper. And you can't have a name that suggests uh, that you um, uh, do have more people working in your office than in fact are working there. And your associates would not be your secretary um, or other um, support staff. Uh, another thing that uh, I have seen is a lawyer who uh, uses uh, multiple office spaces, uh, having virtual office, having a virtual office and no actual office that they themselves are renting. That's fine, it's not a problem, as long as the lawyer indeed has access to the office uh, so that he, he or she can meet clients uh, and um, has adequate and competent support services um, uh, present at that office, can receive calls, so forth. Um, it's important to realize that in a lot of these arrangements, uh, the virtual office also comes with virtual or with support uh, that is contracted to the lawyer. So when you're doing that, make sure that um, the people that uh, are being used to provide you with service are, are getting you your messages, your mail, or whatever else might come into the office to ensure that you are um, providing competent uh, and diligent representation to the client. Another uh, faux pas that uh, can um, often occur with respect to website designs has to do with um, experience. Everyone wants to, of course, uh, appear to be very experienced, uh, and uh, sometimes lawyers who are working together in a firm will try to combine their years of experience, um, each lawyer, say, having one having 10 years and another having two years, and together we have 12 years of experience. No, actually you don't. Um, each lawyer has the amount of experience that, that the lawyer has, and you can't um, uh, make a misleading or deceptive statement, uh, particularly if your firm has only been in existence um, for a year. I think that would kind of make sense. 
Um, an another thing that uh, uh, we as lawyers like to do is we like to talk about who our clients are, and we need to be careful about doing that um, because depending on the particular practice area you're in, um, while it may not um, in some instances be an embarrassment, um, if you're in, say, divorce or criminal law, um, the very existence or the very fact that you have an attorney-client relationship with a particular uh, individual could be confidential information. So one of the things that you want to be sure of um, with respect to your web page, uh, websites and your Facebook page is that you are not um, disclosing confidential information, certainly with respect to um, uh, clientele uh, in, if in particular you have a, the type of practice that involves sensitive information which sort of leads me um, to the idea of web presence in general. You might recognize the guy on the uh, right-hand side as an 800-pound gorilla. Um, everyone wants to be and can be uh, on the Internet, that 800-pound gorilla. They can have a very big web presence and appear to be sort of everywhere at once. Um, here I would pause to remind you spe with respect to, again, the Facebook page, um, that it's important that when you're talking about, if you're going to talk about matters that you've handled, you need to be sure to preserve confidentiality. There are a number of disciplinary cases around the country. We don't have any as yet in Massachusetts, and hopefully uh, this seminar will help keep it that way. Um, but um, there are a number of cases around the country where lawyers, have gotten themselves in trouble um, for blogging uh, about ongoing cases or even cases um, that may not be ongoing uh, and they have revealed confidential information. If you're going to talk about a matter, you should uh, talk about it obviously in a way that the client cannot be identified. Some of the ways in which clients can be identified inadvertently or traced back to the lawyer have to do with the date, obviously. The lawyer says, I came back from court today and this is what happened. Uh, they talk about the court in which they, uh, they appeared. So I came back from Brighton District Court today and I had a great trial with the picture of the client um, on their web page. Uh, they give a general or a more specific description of the case that will allow anyone um, who either was present or might have some bit of information um, uh, to trace back to that specific, uh, that specific client. Uh, and one of the disciplinary cases um, that uh, exist uh, is a, um, a matter in which the lawyer was using thinly veiled um, nicknames. So you might think you're being clever or you might think that you have concealed uh, the client's identity, but you should be careful that if you are going to use such things as nicknames that they are in no way, uh, that they in no way can be tied um, or associated uh, with your client. One might say that it is probably preferable um, not to uh, blog about specific things at all. It's um, often um, uh, uh, preferable to talk about issues rather than specific matters. Um, but again, if you're going to do it, you should certainly be careful to um, uh, uh, maintain your client's confidentiality. I'd like to take some time now uh, to talk about um, an area of marketing and marketing strategy that uh, we're beginning to see more and more, particularly with uh, solos and, and small firm types. Um, here you see that I have the New York State Bar Ethics Opinion on um, uh, AVO. And AVO is a, um, as you know, a, a, a company that has a, uh, that, that um, allows lawyers to have a profile. Uh, they rate um, the lawyer uh, based on the information that it has available, which includes um, disciplinary history, years of practice, 
office address, things that are available uh, to the public. It consolidates all of that information in one place. And as far as it goes as a service uh, available to the public that allows the public to have access uh, to lawyers and know what lawyers exist in a particular jurisdiction, that's great. There are, though, a number of ethical concerns uh, that arise with using the AVO uh, service. So one of the things that uh, you may be aware that AVO does is it asks a lawyer to claim a profile to provide additional information about uh, the lawyer and that improves the rating of the lawyer. So for instance, if you went on AVO and you looked for Stacy Best, what you would find is that um, my practice area is unknown uh, and, and a sentence or a statement that would sort of urge you to look for someone else that AVO might know a little bit more about. And so here we begin to get into the area of concern uh, with respect to ethics. Um, so I would um, take your attention to Rule 7.2B in Massachusetts, and I believe it's 7.2 also in the New York opinion. And the reason I cite to this opinion is because it does a very good job of laying out the reason um, that uh, there are some ethical concerns about AVO, uh, but it also talks about parts of um, the uh, company uh, service that are fine and appropriate as advertising and marketing. So AV AVO charges um, has a AVO Pro subscription service, and as far as I'm aware, what this allows is for a lawyer to um, sign up at, to receive uh, referrals for uh, various um, discrete services and as you may know that under 1.2 uh, a lawyer may limit the scope of representation so long as the client uh, is uh, gives informed consent. So the lawyer signs up for a, uh, uh, to receive referrals for a consultation, document review, or other discrete services. The client on the other side pays AVO, AVO forwards the money to the lawyer, and then on the other side of that takes a marketing fee. The issue, though, is so the, the AVO Pro subscription service um, doesn't make clear that uh, the lawyer is um, paying into, it says that it's a subscription service, but it doesn't make clear that the lawyer is in essence, um, by participating in the AVO program, is giving something of value, which is the prohibition in 7.2, that a lawyer may not pay anything or give anything of value for a recommendation or a referral, except as permitted by 1.5e, which is the rule on splitting fees with another lawyer. Again, a thing a client must consent to before the lawyer can um, enter into that sort of arrangement with another lawyer. So from the client side, what they see is that they're paying AVO, and if you um, look at the AVO site, you will see um, that there's reference to AVO lawyers, um, and it suggests that AVO has, um, uh, has done some review or weeding out or um, assuring that the lawyers there uh, are um, good lawyers. And in fact, what it has done is collected information and uses client reviews, other reviews. It tells you to read the reviews, but again, the impression that a, a non-lawyer might get using that service is that AVO is somehow um, uh, recommending uh, a series, a number of lawyers available to offer competent service. So the lawyer has paid into the subscription service and has therefore given um, uh, something of value to uh, be recommended or part of the AVO Pro service. Another um, form of or area that is fraught with um, particular risks is um, the sort of national firms uh, when people Google, I need a criminal lawyer. One such um, company it was called America's Criminal Defense Group, and you see that I've cited there um, the disciplinary matter that took place in California. 
So this was a California um, company, uh, a lawyer licensed in California who had contracts with uh, various um, lawyers around the country, criminal lawyers, uh, again, uh, providing that the lawyer uh, from the contract with the lawyer had an of counsel relationship. And there is an article on our website, the uh, uh, Board of Bar Overseers, Office of Bar Counsel website um, related to the of counsel relationship. But the contract with America's Defense Group provided for an of counsel relationship on a case by case basis. That's not quite how the of counsel relationship works um, in uh, Massachusetts. And so therefore that um, by itself is a bit deceptive, but that's the lawyer in, in Massachusetts participating or assisting uh, this lawyer in California in, uh, or in an outfit similar to this, a company similar to this, in uh, engaging in deceptive advertisement. It's also a question of whether or not a lawyer in Massachusetts is assisting uh, another lawyer or another company uh, in engaging in unauthorized practice. And, and actually, in the case of the Massachusetts lawyer, they would be assisting a non-lawyer in, um, in engaging in the unauthorized practice of law in Massachusetts. From the client side, uh, when they Google, I need a criminal lawyer, what they get is a, a, a website that would appear to be a firm, and it would talk about our unified um, team. It talked about uh, how the lawyers at the America's Criminal Defense Group were going to participate uh, in the representation in Massachusetts when, in fact, there was going to be no participation they, uh, the, the lawyer in Massachusetts is a, uh, on a contract to provide, again, this very discreet service. Um, and again, while you can limit the scope of your representation um, by participating in this sort of company program with this contract that creates a relationship that is actually not um, uh, an actual uh, of counsel relationship, meaning the lawyer in Massachusetts is going to be handling the matter by themselves, um, that uh, raises the question of whether or not you've engaged in uh, uh, deception with respect to the client. The client is paying the America's Criminal Defense Group and not paying the Massachusetts lawyer, um, but they don't know the difference. And so when the, mass, when the issue arises, they complain about the Massachusetts lawyer and the Massachusetts lawyer, when they, the Massachusetts lawyer says, I didn't get the money, your contract's not with me, your contract is with America's Criminal Defense Group. So those are sort of two um, types of marketing strategies um, that uh, um, we would recommend and I would recommend that you, you steer clear of um, just because they, they raise questions about uh, what is the relationship, what is the client who does the client think they're hiring when they're hiring or using the service? In the case of AVO, is AVO recommending this lawyer? Is there really any quality check um, uh, that AVO is doing in the case of an America's criminal defense group or pick a different area? Um, bankruptcy um, is another um, instance and in, another area of law in which I'm aware this sort of thing has happened. Does the client think they're hiring a firm when in fact they're hiring a uh, single, uh, a, a solo practitioner? The other thing, the other problem that um, these types of um, arrangements raise for Massachusetts lawyers is what happens if the lawyer, in the case of AVO, has a contract to provide uh, eight minutes of consultation, but they realize uh, a few minutes in that it's going to take more than that eight minutes 
to uh, handle the matter competently sort of raises the question of whether or not the lawyer has maintained his professional uh, independence and is exercising his independent judgment uh, accordingly. It also sort of raises the issue in both the situation of AVO and uh, the contract work for a supposed firm as to whether or not the lawyer has a fiduciary obligation to uh, the company to end, to limit the scope of that representation as the client contracted with the company. Um, and if the lawyer does have a fiduciary obligation to the company um, or to the supposed firm, then that creates a potential conflict of interest for the lawyer and would therefore be a, a violation of Rule 1.7. So there are just a number of uh, ways in which um, uh, a list like uh, with the recommendation uh, such as AVO that the lawyer is paying into um, and with uh, these sort of national firms when there really isn't uh, any uh, more ongoing relationship between the lawyer and the company that raise a number of ethical considerations that um, the lawyer should be careful of and think carefully about. The last thing that I want to talk about is uh, solicitation. And I think that's sort of very fairly straightforward um, and uh, don't really think that we need to spend a lot of time on that. But again, with respect to the internet interaction, uh, a lot of times, again, the client is looking for 1-800, I need a lawyer and a lawyer is part of a list and um, uh, the lawyer receives a message that a client is looking for um, uh, a lawyer and so then the lawyer gets the client's information and contacts um, contacts the potential client and, and begins uh, the communication. I just want to pause here to say or note for your attention that um, Rule 7.3, which is the rule on solicitation, uh, does uh, prohibit uh, real-time electronic means ex uh, for contact, except in, in limited instances, those being one in which the lawyer is, is familiar with the uh, potential client because the lawyer has previously represented uh, the client. Uh, where the lawyer has a familial relationship, a family relationship with the potential client. Uh, also, where the lawyer is talking to another lawyer or otherwise talking to a potential commercial client. So those are excluded from the idea of making real-time uh, electronic contact, um, but uh, everything else is, is um, within uh, the gambit that real-time electronic contact is, is not permitted. There are other limitations which, again, I think are sort of self-explanatory within the rule, um, and those include when a person says that they don't want to be solicited, you need to stop the solicitation, and a situation in which uh, the circumstances would be such that the the potential client is not able to, um, uh, because of physical or mental or emotional um, circumstances, able to give informed uh, consent or consent to the representation uh, to retain or hire the lawyer. Um, it should be noted there that um, there is some provision for uh, non-profit uh, um, um, uh, agencies to um, um, offer services. In other words, the prohibition in Rule 7.3 is solicitation for a fee. So if you're not soliciting or approaching the client for a fee, um, the prohibition of that rule, um, those limitations on the rule don't particularly apply. And I would go back to, uh, again, note that um, while um, a lawyer may respond to a request um, uh, for information by a potential client, 
you should be careful that if you are part of a list that you, and this list is part of a web page, that you review the web page and make sure that the web page or the list is operated in a way consistent with the rules of professional conduct. So if there are statements that are misleading and deceptive, um, particularly about um, responding or chatting uh, with potential clients, you should be wary about your um, participation. I, I think that I've covered all the rules that are on the bottom uh, left, um, but if I have not covered um, all of those things, um, we do have a uh, hotline that the Office of Bar Council offers every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday between the hours of 2 and 4 p.m. You just call our main number at 617 728-8750 and the person who is assigned that day will answer your calls and if you happen to give us uh, uh, the type of question that um, uh, stumps the chumps um, we're happy to um, dialogue about it in our office uh, we have um, internal communications and we all sort of rely on one another to make sure that we are giving uh, our best uh, advice we don't offer ethical opinions um, because of course you change the facts we change the answer um, but we do do our best to assist you so please if anything that I've said uh, today has uh, not been clear or you have questions Monday, Wednesday, or Friday between 2 and 4, 617-728-8750. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Thank you.